Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The reign of Elizabeth II comes to a close after 70 years at the age of 96. At her coronation, the Queen repeated her pledge to serve her people and fulfilled it throughout her reign with a combination of skill and a sense of duty. The crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. Hip, hip. I speak to you today with feelings of profound sorrow. Throughout her life, Her Majesty the Queen, my beloved mother, was an inspiration, an example to me and to all my family. After 70 years of Queen Elizabeth II's reign, her death in September 2022 marked a monumental change for Great Britain. And in particular, one man who'd been waiting in the wings for decades. Elizabeth's son, Prince Charles, had been preparing for the role of king for most of his life. But is it really a role you can prepare for? In a time of great instability in the United Kingdom, the world asks, who is Charles III? Can he step into the shoes of Queen Elizabeth, who'd performed her role impeccably for so long? And what does the future of the British monarchy really look like? The current king was the longest running Prince of Wales in history. He had 73 years to fill his time and until he landed the top job, so to speak. So he had to make the role his own. As Prince of Wales, Charles visited more than 100 countries around the world and represented Great Britain abroad for more than 70 years. He served in the Royal Navy, created projects of social interest and developed environmental initiatives. In addition, Charles also represented the Queen in the handover ceremony of Hong Kong to China, attended the ceremonies held to mark Barbados's transition into a parliamentary republic, and participated in thousands of official events in the United Kingdom and across the globe. But now, he has a different job. The Crown represents a unifying factor in Britain. It's that unifying factor which is very valuable for a country. Politics represents our various conflicts between left and right, Labour and Conservative, Brexit or Remain. But the monarchy represents something over and above that. He's now the great monarch of the United Kingdom and, as such, will have to ensure the survival of the crown and guarantee that it remains a relevant institution. The new king is a very thoughtful and very sensitive man. He, unlike his parents, who were 
much more straightforward in so much as that they just got on with the job and they didn't give a jot. He does mind about these things and he, he is a more introverted figure. So in that respect, you get a, a, a different type of person from his predecessors. Those who met him on any of his many trips around the world praise his kind nature and thoughtfulness. Charles is really a prince. Charles is really a gentleman. Very, very delightful and very humble, very close to people, very attentive to details. He was really trying to make us comfortable and with confidence in everything we were making with him, we were doing with him. So he was really charming and, and very close to us. Very friendly and very simple and very interested in what the people need. Es una gran persona. Quienes hemos tenido esa oportunidad de estrechar su mano, se siente esa calidez humana. Charles's sensitivity is also evident in the extensive list of tastes and passions that the new king has cultivated from a young age. Well, Prince Philip liked to paint, he too likes to paint, and both of them would get up early in the morning if they were on a visit overseas to spend a little bit of time in quiet contemplation, just painting the view where they were. He loves opera, he loves classical music. Uh, this is something that he inherited from his grandmother. Queen Elizabeth's mother, who also loved music. He's a lover of literature, you know, he's, he loves books, he loves reading. It's something that probably relaxes him. It's something he does that he enjoys. One of his greatest passions is gardening. He has written articles, he has been interviewed about his gardens. It's something that he, um, he shares with his wife, with Camila, who loves uh, also gardening and loves to walk around and looking at trees and looking at the green. He, it's something that he puts a lot of effort to. And it, it has to do a lot also with the, with the environmental stuff that he leads to a lot. But perhaps his best known quality is relentless hard work. Charles is, is notoriously hardworking, and in fact, he wears out quite a lot of his aides. On one occasion, he went to a reception at Buckingham Palace, went home and changed out of white tie, got on a flight to Washington, went to the funeral of George Bush, came back to Britain. Everybody else collapsed and went home, but he went out to a reception at the Royal Academy, followed by a dinner for the Prince's Trust. When one of his aides said, how do you cope? He said, well, I'm looking forward to it and I don't want to let people down. I mean, there was occasions when I would even go to bed and he would still be working away. Somebody that, that's dedicated to the job. His day begins over breakfast when he listens to the news on the radio. Contrary to public perception, he doesn't have a boiled egg. He usually has fruit and seeds and a cup of tea. He'll then work all the way through until lunchtime. He doesn't have lunch, but he will go and stretch his legs outside and go for a walk because he needs to be in the, in the countryside or outside in the environment. He will then work through till about five o'clock when he'll have a cup of tea, often with the Queen Consort, with sandwiches and a piece of cake in a Tupperware container. The cake will then be put back into the container and for tea the next day, he doesn't like waste as his mother. He, he's very frugal by nature. Then he'll work through till dinner and instead of watching television or reading a book, he'll go back to his desk and, and work till well after midnight. People don't understand that he's very, very, very vulnerable of the fact that he doesn't have a father or a mother anymore to rely on. He's Paris were his biggest supporters, and he was raised to be king, and he knew that they was gonna come, but he never thought he was gonna feel so lonely without his parents. He is by himself.
From a very young age, Charles knew that a great responsibility rested on his shoulders. In the royal pew, the attentive figure of four-year-old Prince Charles watched in wonderment, mixed with just a bit of boyish energy, as his mother received the scepter and orb of the British Empire. Sitting beside the Queen Mother, little Charles already knew that Crown would one day be his. Prince Charles finds grandmother a patient teacher as he tries to absorb the meaning and significance of what he sees and hears. For here, knighthood reaches its full flower in the 20th century, in these relics of Britain's earlier days of heraldry and chivalry, stemming from William the Conqueror. A large order for four-year-old eyes and ears, but someday this pageantry may mark his own coronation. He may hold the scepter of power and the rod of mercy as the climactic moment approaches. The coronation of Elizabeth II marked the beginning of a new era for the United Kingdom. When the Queen came to the throne, Britain and the world were still coping with the privations and aftermath of the Second World War, and still living by the conventions of earlier times. Everything that the Queen did in the way of modernizing the monarchy was very gradual and almost imperceptible. But then, of course, if you look at what the monarchy was like in 1952 and compare that to what she was doing more recently, it's completely different. So yes, she did modernize the monarchy. In the 1950s, which is this uber-masculine decade, she rocks up as this kind of young queen. It's so unlikely, it's so fresh, and actually so unthreatening because of her gender. The kind of feminine icon is very different from Charles. He's a bit sort of pale male stale when everyone's again the pale male stale establishment, even though he's always been a bit counter to that establishment narrative. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. From the day he was born at Buckingham Palace, the world has enjoyed a front row seat in the life of Charles Philip Arthur George. Her Royal Highness is the proud and happy mother of a prince. The salute is fired, and in the monarch's home lies the infant boy who will one day be king. However, being proud new parents didn't mean Elizabeth and Philip's royal duties stopped. And from an early age, Charles had to get used to the prolonged absences of his parents. We can probably say he would have liked a bit more of the kind of cosseting that some children in the 50s definitely did get. If you drill into the early life of Charles, well, You'll probably have heard of this wonderful, happiest time that Elizabeth and Philip had in Malta. During that time, when Philip served in Malta, which was all Charles's early years, his formative years, and Elizabeth goes over there to keep her eye on Philip, and Charles was left behind in Sandringham. It's disparate. He's not given conventional parental love. Elizabeth had to take on more and more responsibilities of the crown in the face of the delicate health of her father, King George VI, and she had very little time left to share with her young children, who lived under the care of nannies. Cameras find Prince Charles not so forthcoming as usual. Whilst Princess Anne behaves with glorious unconcern, Prince Charles seems to miss somebody. And I think it's not until Charles's fourth birthday that his dad's actually present for his birthday, until he's four and everything's settled down because, of course, the Queen's got a thumping great crown on her head. On 
On the one hand, he has his father berating him, be tougher, you know, run faster, complain less. On the other hand, he has this sort of slightly distant mother who's getting on with the job, doing everything that lots of women wish they could do. Being a working mum in the 50s, I mean, that was totally revolutionary. And so Charles is kind of out on a limb, a bit on his own. If he didn't get attention or enough attention from his parents, he certainly got lots from his grandmother. I know what my darling grandmother meant to um, so many other people. And for me, she meant um, everything. But ever since I was a child, I adored her. Uh, her houses were always filled with uh, an atmosphere of fun, laughter, and uh, affection. And I, I learned so much from her of immense value in, in my life. What actually she spotted was that he was an insecure figure who needed exactly the same boosting up as she gave to George VI, her husband. And it was a, a very, very strong and actually a lovely relationship that he had with his grandmother. She saw the funny side of life and we laughed till we cried. And oh, I shall miss those laughs. But the Queen Mother was not the only person who filled the void that the constant absences of Elizabeth II and Prince Philip left in the life of little Charles. Another character would be integral to his upbringing, his great uncle, Lord Mountbatten. He was a, a tricky character, Mountbatten. It was a very interfering and dominating character, um, a man who could be very charming and could also be very disagreeable. And I'm sure from the point of view of Prince Charles, the charm was turned on 100%. He looked up to Mountbatten, who of course had been a, had, had a fascinating life and was full of a good advice and sometimes bad advice. His influence with Prince Charles was very strong. From an early age, Charles was fascinated by the war stories and round-the-world travels of his uncle Dickie, known by the rest of the world as the first Earl Mountbatten of Burma, first Sea Lord of the Royal Navy and last Viceroy of India. He's good-looking, he's accomplished, he's brave, he's well-connected. This is a man you want on your side. So not only is he the second cousin of King George VI, but he's also the uncle of Philip, of Prince Philip. I know he's instrumental in the, the meeting of and then um, paving the way for the marriage between Philip and Elizabeth. So he's a key player. was educated at Buckingham Palace until the age of eight. He then became the first heir to the throne to attend a school, Hill House School, in London. Around this time, his mother made him Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester, an unimaginable responsibility for any other child born in Britain. He found himself feeling bewildered. And at that young age, you can see how it was dawning on him that this responsibility would one day be his. Charles was a very shy child, very different from his father, the temperamental Prince Philip. Prince Philip found a very insecure child and thought that he needed to be, if I put it like this, have confidence instilled in him. And the methods used, I think most people would agree, were wrong. When Charles was 13, Philip decided to send him to Scotland to study at Gordonston, the same school he'd attended. And the way also, he was mercilessly bullied. And people liked saying, you know, I kicked the King of England, that sort of rather horrible attitude. Uh, or he got hit by a pillow at night and so forth. Gordonston seems to have been absolute hell for him. It was a mistake, a very bad mistake, between, uh, of Prince Philip to send him there. At Gordonston, Charles was taunted, insulted, teased, and even reportedly locked naked in a basket and left under a cold shower. For that to happen to a 40-year-old boy was a particularly awful experience, and he absolutely hated it. He detested the school, which he called Calderton Kilson. 
Kolditz was a Nazi prisoner of war camp, which Charles likened his school to. For him, his time at Gordonston was a prison sentence in which he felt a crushing loneliness, from which he took refuge in creative pursuits such as pottery and theatre. Charles was at Gordonston, which he hated, but nonetheless there was the opportunity, and this was also seen as diplomatically significant, that he would spend uh, what turned out to be quite a stint at Timbertop a School in Australia. Charles loved it at Timbertop. In Australia, Charles felt liberated. Timbertop is the most isolated campus of Geelong Grammar School in Victoria, where contact with nature is an everyday part of the educational experience. He loved Australia, loved his time at Geelong G Grammar School. That was a, a time when he really sort of came out of himself, actually. That made a huge difference to him. In Australia, Charles went on cross-country expeditions, had camping nights, and made trips that would stay with him forever. His interest as a sort of schoolboy anthropologist came when he went to Papua New Guinea and saw uh, the tribe's people living as, a, in a sense, of a sort of back to basic. There, beside, there was a sort of simplicity and a back to nature aspect. And that was the catalyst, I think, for uh, what has become the great campaigning, uh, or the great campaign of his life, and that is on the environment. Charles returned from Timbertop transformed. Back at Gordonston for another year, he even managed to be elected by his peers as head boy of his school, a title also held by his father decades earlier. He has always been very keen to do things which his father did. You'll find that Prince Philip did pretty much everything to do with climate change and the green things and conservation and indeed setting up the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme is a is a classic sort of precursor to the Prince's Trust, which is one of Prince Charles's most successful enterprises. In 1976, Charles created this charitable organization to help underprivileged young people through grants, training courses and tutoring. The reason that I, I started the Prince's Trust 30 years ago was that I believed um, it was important that young people from whatever background uh, should have an opportunity to fulfill their potential, uh, but particularly those from disadvantaged circumstances. Something like the Prince's Trust was tremendously important and it uh, chair, you know, it, it influenced government policy subsequently too, so that was, that was very significant. From its inception, the Prince's Trust has been concerned with tackling issues vital to society. Many of these, such as mental health, were not particularly understood some decades ago. And so the Prince's Trust were outliers in offering much needed support. The Trust was established in 1976, and in those days, I remember, there was a great deal of skepticism and a certain amount of disbelief amongst um, quite a large number of people uh, about the ideas that I was, I was putting forward. And I think we have demonstrated that uh, the original ideas that we worked out in those days can actually be made to work. The Prince's Trust has helped many young unemployed find jobs. It's done a lot for members of ethnic minorities and ex-prisoners. And in my view, this is the way in which the monarchy is going to develop. Everyone knows of the Prince's Trust and thinks it's brilliant. But there are about 20 charities that Charles is actually or was involved in since he stepped back from them. The sheer scale of his charitable work is extraordinary because it involves Romania, New Zealand, Wales, Australia, Canada. Uh, it involves drawing, it involves business, it involves environmental policy, and, and so on. It's so vast. These charities raise something like £100 million a year. 
As a prince, Charles helped not only the British people, but people in need around the world, like Humberto, a young Mexican boy who was orphaned and left homeless after a tragic explosion in the neighborhood where he lived, in the city of Guadalajara. El dona unos departamentos para las familias más necesitadas por eh, la catástrofe del 22 de abril de 1992. Yo fui beneficiado con uno de esos departamentos. En ese momento, contar con ese apoyo y, y con esa generosidad de habernos dado un, un techo fue indescriptible. The greatest achievement of um... Charles III is to have found a role for himself as Prince of Wales, primarily through his various charities and the work he's done for the disfranchised, the underprivileged, and so on. I think that marks a new dimension of monarchy and is a real development of a public service monarchy. Years before, Prince Philip had understood the importance of the humanitarian work of the royal family and instilled this in his son from a very young age. Prince Charles's love of ecology and sustainability comes from his, his father, the Duke of Edinburgh, who was passionate about saving the environment and conservation and sustainability. Totally useless for a lot of well-meaning people to wring their hands in conference and to point out the dangers of pollution or destruction of the country's countryside if no one is willing or capable of taking any action. The battle against climate change is surely the most defining and pivotal challenge of our times. We are running out of time. How many times have I found myself saying this over recent years? We cannot delay, regroup, prevaricate, or wait for more and better information, and should act now to restore the health of the planet before it is too late. This, of course, will require an unprecedented transformation of our communities, science, societies, and lifestyles, all predicated on the move to a low carbon and circular economy. The king's greatest passion has always been the environment. His garden at Highgrove is, is organic and sustainable. He has a product line of, of organic food. He, he's very into the environment to ensure that it's saved for the future of his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Prince Charles was always interested in learning about those ecosystems that could provide valuable knowledge for his environmental cause. He always found a way to connect his responsibilities and formal duties as Prince of Wales with his interest in the environment, creating his own agenda and forging his own path within the royal family. Charles visited Mexico five times as Prince of Wales and managed to stop in places that were interesting to him because of their environmental value. There is this uh, lake area of Mexico City called Xochimilco. And ever since the history of Mexico began, there has been a system in which people would make some artificial islands. So it is a floating piece of farming land in the lake. We got the communication from his office in London asking to visit Xochimilco and the Chinampa system. And the Mexican government would come back with a proposal. They said, no, 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 it's too dangerous because of the Chinampas, water, et cetera, et cetera, and it's not too clean. So what they had proposed was to have a demonstration plot at one of the universities with one PhD explaining how it worked. So they sent this information to London. London came back to say, no, Prince Charles wants to talk to the people and he wants to see how it works on site. And the gov Mexican government, I mean, was reluctant to do it. But in the end of the day, off we go. Prince Charles, the team and myself, we were there in, in Xochimilco. You can tell he enjoyed the visit thoroughly because he was really paying attention. He knows about environment, he knows about sustainable development, he knows about climate change, and he is very well versed in those issues and the 
topics that have to be promoted in order to uh, mitigate climate change, to adapt to climate change, to promote sustainable development activities everywhere he goes. Charles has spent much of his life studying the environment. He's traveled all over the world, visiting habitats affected by climate change, trying to learn how to navigate it. In the late 80s, Charles visited the Amazonian jungle in Venezuela. He wanted to understand how its inhabitants dealt organically with living in such a difficult environment and how to preserve this important part of the planet that's been described as the lungs of the world. And so, remarkably, the future King of England found himself deep in the Venezuelan jungle. When uh, Prince Charles came here, I had the opportunity of being with him in the jungle. And he was very interested in the people of the jungle, especially the peasants and the Indians, and what were they obtaining from the jungle. And we were talking about ecology and uh, the ecology of the jungle and what could be used in the jungle to, to be useful for men and the protection of the jungle. And this impressed me very much. But he was ahead. He was thinking ahead of everyone else. Today, Charles is recognized as an expert in environmental and charitable issues, and his education played a vital role in this. In 1967, Prince Charles became the first heir to the throne to attend university. Prince Charles, the future King of England, becomes a college freshman. Lord Butler, Master of Trinity, greets the Prince, who will major in archaeology and anthropology. The heir to the throne looks like his mother and walks like his father. Charles's grandfather and great-grandfather were both students here. Well-wishers shouted, good luck, and the prince replied, I'll need it. At Trinity College, Cambridge, Charles continued to develop his personal interests, immersing himself in the performing arts and showing a special interest in comedy. Uh -huh. But royal duty interrupted his stay at the University of Cambridge. His coronation as Prince of Wales was fast approaching. To prepare for the investiture, Charles was sent to study Welsh. The idea was that he spent a term at the University of Wales at Aberystwyth, that he learned Welsh or learned a certain amount of Welsh, and this would fit him for a job. It was a magnificent PR opportunity. Charles's stay in Wales sparked an obsession with the prince on the streets of Aberystwyth. The street thronged with tourists, hoping for a chance to see him and shops sold royal souvenirs, triggering a sudden interest in Wales and its language. But many Welsh nationalists didn't support Charles's investiture as Prince of Wales. There was a minority in Wales who strongly resented it, and when he spent a term, his tutor was actually a Welsh nationalist. It was a wonderful piece of PR. And in the short time that he's been working, he's developed a very good accent, and uh, I'm sure it's going to stand him in very good stead from now on. Meanwhile, the town of Carnarvon was eagerly preparing for his coronation. Charles was invested as Prince of Wales by his mother in July 1969 in a tradition-laden televised ceremony that was watched by millions around the world. After the investiture, Charles returned to Cambridge and finished his studies. Then he took his place in the House of Lords and took on duties cutting ribbons, unveiling plaques across the United Kingdom and travelling to far-flung corners of the world on his mother's behalf. 
but nobody knew what his intentions were as Prince of Wales, nor what his future responsibilities would be. Thank you very much. You really, you really ought to wait and to hear what I have to say first before you get too enthusiastic. There is no job description for what you're to do as Prince of Wales, as heir to the throne. He could have done nothing at all. He could have frittered away his life in nightclubs and on the polo field, but he didn't do that. Although Charles swears allegiance to the crown and works tirelessly to live up to his obligations, privately, he suffers in silence from the ostentatious weight of the crown. He was asked by, in 1969 by Jack DiManio, you know, sort of, when did you first realize that you were, you know, Prince of Wales and things. He sort of said at that point, you know, I didn't sort of wake up in my pram suddenly one day and say, yippee. I mean, it dawned on him, he's, as he said, with a sort of ghastly, inexorable sense that people expected more from him. Above all, what the royal family expected of him was to find a wife and produce an heir to ensure the line of succession. But the requirement of securing an appropriate wife was considered more important than Charles's personal happiness. The long road that Charles has traveled to become the new King of Great Britain has not been without sacrifices. Of all of them, undoubtedly the most significant was a wait of almost three decades to be with the love of his life, Camilla. Charles and Camilla's love story is one of the most extraordinary um, stories that you could imagine, really. Um, it lasted for decades. It was always intense, and they were just made for each other. But um, outside of themselves, uh, there were so many difficult things they had to overcome that is astonishing that they stayed together and still quite obviously in love. They were undoubtedly ideal for each other, the same uh, ages, the same friends, the same sense of humor, mutually so supportive. The tragedy, of course, of his life is that they were not together from the start when they met in the early 1970s. 1970 was the year in which the prince's love life was marked forever. Thanks to Lucia Santa Cruz, daughter to the then Chilean ambassador to the United Kingdom, Charles met Camilla Shand in London. Lucia thought it was a very nice idea to introduce Camilla to Charles, and they hit it off extremely well. They had lots of things in common. They loved walking, they loved horses, they loved the countryside. They also had very similar senses of humor. At the time, Camilla was in a complicated, on again, off again relationship with Army veteran Andrew Parker Bowles. However, that doesn't stop them from transforming their initial friendship into a discreet romance. Prince Charles was 22 at the time, and Camilla was 24. And Lord Mountbatten, he used to provide rooms in one of his homes in the countryside where they could be private. And But he, he never thought of her as being um, Charles's bride. Despite having won the prince's heart, Camilla does not meet the requirements that the royal family expect from the woman who would one day become queen. One of those reasons was that at the time, the heir to the throne uh, had to have a, a wife who was a virgin and also from a highly aristocratic family. Camilla came from a sort of very nice family, but it wasn't actually in the top levels. Um, but also she had a bit of history because she'd been going out with Andrew Parker Bowles since she was 17. Among all the possible partners within his reach, the prince falls in love with the only woman he cannot have. Mountbatten 
Bretagne used to berate him for that. You're being self-centered, like the late Duke of Windsor. You'll end up a, a nothing man like him. And I think it's, you know, in that context that he came across Camilla the first time. You know, obviously, he didn't read the full Mountbatten rule book. Have fun with a filly, but for God's sake, don't get too invested in her. You know, that kind of thing. It's one thing sowing your wild oats, it's another becoming emotionally attached. Uh, this is the great conundrum that's always struck the royal family, is the connection between matters of the heart, love, and um, the position of head of state. Because the two are intrinsically connected and it makes it very, very complicated. We saw that with the abdication in 36. In 1936, King Edward VIII, later Duke of Windsor, abdicated after less than a year of reign after the government, the church, and the royal family opposed his marriage to Wallace Simpson, an American woman who'd already been married twice and with whom he fell madly in love. The history of the royal family was forever marked by the Duke of Windsor's decision, and Charles was made aware from an early age that he was not an example to emulate. Following in the footsteps of his father, grandfather, and great-grandparents, in 1971, Charles began his career in the Royal Navy, and his military duties took him away from Camilla. I think the relationship fell apart because he went to the Navy, and it's a long time for somebody not to see each other. You don't have mobiles then. Um, but also, I think that although he liked her enormously, he, he realised his parents also would not. He didn't want to cause any disruption within the royal family, so he didn't want to come along with this huge request for um, a young woman who was not suitable. Physical separation eventually fractures the fragile romance. Uh, Camilla, who was not somebody who wanted to hang around because she'd been brought up not to have a career but to get married and have children and horses and dogs and parties and nice dinner parties. She went back to Andrew Parker Bowles and they got married. Far from home, the news is a hard blow for Charles. Prince Charles was away uh, on his naval boat when he heard that she was getting married and he was absolutely heartbroken. It seems that a whole swirl of unhappiness uh, covered him because he realised through absence how much he had fallen in love with her. In 1976, Charles completed his naval career. And that was a big crossroads from Charles. The two things that concerned him, finding a role, a suitable role, that wasn't politically contentious, didn't seem like it was cashing in on his royal status. And the other big question, of course, was finding a suitable bride. Because we know that the great success story of monarchy in the 20th century, it's replaced political power with this family image, family monarchy, the pin-up for domestic Britain. During the following years, the pressure for Charles to marry and secure the line of succession to the throne grows steadily. In search of the best candidate, Charles engages in multiple romances. Prince Charles was very much known as a playboy prince. He dated a lot of very beautiful women. He was constantly in the headlines for his love life. His love affairs include Lady Jane Wellesley, daughter of the 8th Duke of Wellington, Sabrina Guinness, an icon of her generation, who would later also date celebrities such as Mick Jagger, Jack Nicholson, and David Bowie, Lord Mountbatten's granddaughter, Lady Amanda Natchbull, and Anna Wallace, daughter of a wealthy Scottish landowner. Charles proposed to the latter two, but they both declined. However, by the time his relationship with Anna broke up, Charles had already met the woman who would later become his wife. Prince Charles knew he had to get married, particularly by the time he got to 30. 
his parents were nagging and nagging him because they wanted an heir to the throne. And he'd known the Spencers for a very long time. They had a country house very near the Queen's and they would come to parties at the palace. And he um, was invited to a um, shooting afternoon. And there he saw Sarah, who was Diana's older sister, and he started dating her. It was during his brief romance with Sarah Spencer that Charles and Lady Diana's paths first crossed. I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. And I mean, great fun mm. and bouncy and full of life and everything. And um, um, I don't know what you thought of me. But... Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Three years later, they meet again, and their destinies end up coming together. After only 13 dates, Charles asks her to marry him, and in February 1981, the couple officially announces their engagement. I, uh, I asked uh, Diana before she went to Australia, two or three days before, because I thought it would be a good idea that, uh, apart from anything else, if she went to Australia, she could then think about it, and if she didn't like the idea, she could... Uh, Say she didn't know she did. She she could say that, but in fact, you you actually said yes, quite yes, promptly. <laughs> Next to it, Charles and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. And I'm I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> <laughs> However, when asked if they are in love, the difference in their answers is already starting to catch everyone's attention. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> well, it you obviously means your own interpretation. In July 1981, St. Paul's Cathedral became the setting for what the media dubbed the wedding of the century. In the eyes of the press and the general public, they were the perfect couple like something out of a fairy tale. There's always been a, a fascination with the royal family for, for various reasons. We've all grown up with fairy tales and, and stories about kings and queens, princes and princesses, and I think there's a certain mystique about them. Less than a year later, the Prince and Princess of Wales have a son, William. Charles has finally secured the line of succession and has a wife who seems to fulfill everyone's expectations. However, the apparent fantasy marriage is soon tinged with conflict. Charles and Diana were very different people. Charles is a very cerebral man. He loves the countryside. He enjoys nature. He goes for walks every day and loves to be in the outdoors. Diana was very much younger, very inexperienced, and much more of a townie. He liked reading non-fiction. She liked reading sort of fairy tale love stories. They had really nothing in common whatsoever. There was 12 years difference between them, and Diana was quite naive and young and innocent. Perhaps that's why, despite being married, Charles and Camilla do not cut off contact. The, the moment Prince Charles proposed to Diana, he and Camilla had a phone conversation in which they agreed they would not see each other. But they would talk on the phone occasionally just to keep in touch. But I think that the feeling that he had when he first met her, that she was the only person he could really talk to, did stay with him. In the face of Diana's unstoppable popularity, the prince begins to feel overshadowed. However, he's not the only one who feels jealousy in the relationship. This time, the princess is aware of the place that Camilla occupies in her husband's life.
Even after the birth of their second son, Harry, now Duke of Sussex, Charles and Diana are unable to reconcile their growing marital differences, and Diana's mental health gets worse. Because she wasn't always stable um, in her mind, it made her very difficult. I mean, she would scream and shout and get hysterical. So Charles got increasingly depressed because he couldn't find a way to connect with her or make her feel loved or better. She wanted a lot of attention, understandably, and um, she, she didn't get it, so she was terribly unhappy. Camilla, for her part, also struggles with her own personal drama. She got quite unhappy. Um, as a wife to Andrew because he was very, very unfaithful to her. Sometimes with her own friends, she would hear about it from them. And so it was unstabling for her. With both marriages irreparably broken, in 1986, Charles and Camilla resumed their love affair. Two of his friends got so concerned about him that they rang Camilla without asking him and saying that you're the only one who can help him. He's in a very bad way. And please, will you ring him and um, talk to him because we're very concerned about him. So she did and they met and they got back together. But this was after Diana had two relationships of her own uh, earlier. One was with a police protection officer and one was a military man who she later admitted that she fell hopelessly in love with. Over the next six years, the relationship between Charles and Diana becomes increasingly unbearable. In June 1992, Diana, Her True Story is published, a biography that Diana secretly cooperated with that publicly exposes Charles's affair with Camilla, the princess's deep unhappiness, and her hard battle with her mental health. Public opinion sides with Diana, declaring her a victim of the prince and the royal family. Charles was painted the villain because I mean, he was older, he was wiser, he didn't look after her. So there was this beautiful young woman who could make you feel sorry for her in the way that she looked at you. I mean, she was tremendously good at convincing people that, you know, she was unhappy and that she was um, a sort of victim. Whereas Prince Charles didn't do anything like that and he was very easily and blamed for all that. In the midst of the media whirlwind, the couple separated in 1992, initially agreeing not to divorce. However, at the end of 1995, Diana's statements once again caused a scandal after she confirmed their infidelities in a television interview. A month later, the Queen ordered the couple to divorce. The Queen was a very religious woman and would not have approved of any of her children's divorces. She obviously would have wanted them to stick to their marriages, but I think she was also pragmatic and, and realised that she came from a different era and she wanted her children to be happy. The royal couple legally and definitively separated in 1996. And by then, Camilla was also a divorced woman. Thus, 26 years after they met, Charles and Camilla are finally free to resume their love affair that for decades seemed impossible. However, their plans to share it with the world are soon to be thwarted. In 1997, 
while traveling in Paris with her new partner, the Egyptian businessman Dodi Al Fayed, the Princess of Wales dies tragically in a car accident. At the time, William and Harry and Prince Charles were up in Scotland. It was August and they were on holiday there. So the statement came through that she'd passed away at one o'clock in the morning. Um, Prince Charles just didn't know what to do. And he called Camilla. Camilla's response to that was, I feel so sorry for the children. This is going to be so hard for your children. He went to wake the queen and say, uh, should I wake the children? And she said, maybe not, wait till seven o'clock. So he went in and told William and they both cried, not just William. Prince Charles cried as two. And then uh, William said, I'll come with you to talk to Harry. And, and they went into Harry's bedroom and told him. And Harry cried too, and so Prince Charles cried again, and uh, they didn't know what to do. Over the next week, millions of people fill the streets of London in an emotional farewell for Diana. Diana's death, there was this extraordinary outpouring of emotion. You had millions of flowers in front of palaces and so forth. It, and the mood was very, very ugly. It was terribly sad and painful to watch Prince Harry hold his father's hand and bend down and show him some flowers or show him a note or a little toy that had been left in the piles of flowers um, all around Buckingham Palace, as well as Kensington Palace and, and the park. Um, and it was um, a tragic, absolute tragedy. royal household officiates the historic funeral of the princess at Westminster Abbey, attended by 2,000 mourners. I also wanted to say how particularly moved and uh, enormously comforted my children and I were, and indeed still are, by um, the public response to, to Diana's death. It has been really quite remarkable and indeed, in many ways, overwhelming. When Diana died, Charles was in an invidious position. The couple had separated and divorced, and he had two young sons to bring up. He was very worried about them and how they would cope with losing their mother so young. I'm uh, unbelievably proud of the, the children, of William and Harry. They've been quite remarkable. Uh, and I think they've handled an extraordinarily difficult time, uh, as I'm sure all of you can imagine, with quite enormous courage uh, and um, the greatest possible dignity. William, William. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, He was also in a very difficult position because he was notably in a relationship with another woman. Um, and that really had to go on the slow mode. Before Diana died, he would have wanted to introduce Camilla to the public as his girlfriend, but that really had to be put on hold. Despite taking care not to be seen publicly with Camilla, Charles's popular approval dropped to 42%, with only 36% of the population supporting his future coronation. He had to work a lot to build his own image. He was no longer Prince Charles, he was just the cheating bastard that broke Princess Diana's heart. That was it. 
And it's very sad to see how much he loves his work and it's not recognized. And that's sad that it's what people saw during a long, long time. The following year, the prince gradually begins the difficult process of legitimizing his relationship with Camilla and, at the same time, repairing the multiple blows to his reputation. Mark Boland came along to help improve Prince Charles's um, image. And he gradually said, well, you know, if you are going out with her, don't hide her away. Go to the theater, or go to the opera or the ballet, take her with you. You know, people can't make any judgments of her if they don't see her, let them see her. And gradually people did see her for who she was. The couple's image changed over time, and the public, not only in Britain but around the world, gradually came to understand their situation. He represents a changing social scene when half of marriages went to the wayside, and his was one of them, you know, and it was all a bit messy in an age of mass media. And, and I think that there's been an element of understanding, and we've come to terms with that in Britain. And in our press, of course, the Conservative press has started to back Camilla, so we've had this much warmer. Um, image of her. At the end of 1999, Charles finally introduces Camilla as his official partner. But more than gaining popular support, Camilla is interested in being accepted by the prince's children. Camilla was very careful not to try and be another mother. She wanted to be a friend. She wanted just um, to be liked by them, but she didn't push herself. And um, William, at first, was very angry. He did agree to meet her once just to see her. And they got on all right. It was just a 20-minute chat. And they, um, they did decide at that time, quite early on, that they wanted to make a surprise birthday party for their father, who was going to be 50. And they um, said to him they had were going to invite Camilla because they knew that he would like her to be there. So he was thrilled about that. Meanwhile, the queen, who they also invited, wouldn't go because Camilla was there. But eventually, after overcoming resistance, Camilla is finally accepted by the queen as her son's companion. While in Scotland on New Year's Day 2005, the Prince of Wales proposes to Camilla. Camilla was extremely nervous on the day of their wedding and she refused to get up until it was quite late. She didn't want anybody there screaming and shouting on such a special day which they'd waited decades for. And they wanted it a low played, um, event that she didn't wear white, she didn't wear a tiara, but she managed to look magnificent. The Queen didn't go, the head of the church, she felt it was inappropriate. But it's a bit of a shame for her son. Although she didn't attend the ceremony, Elizabeth II was present at the subsequent reception at Windsor Castle. People describe it as having a weight lifted from their shoulders. They looked amazing. And uh, one of Camilla's aides said to me, they came upstairs in Windsor Castle once they got married, and they both burst into tears. They're also the best of friends. They are a team. They work so well together. He's so good for her, she is so good for him. And when they get the giggles, God help you if you're next to them, because that's the funniest thing, even to this day, that I've ever seen. I remember over the years being at different events, and before anyone else noticed, being a member of the staff, you would notice fast, and then normally would 
if he was having to go and disappear behind the screen or something to stop giggling, you know, because otherwise everyone starts laughing. So that, that's what's really nice about the two of them, that, that chemistry. Once he was allowed to um, marry the woman he genuinely loved, Camilla, I think everything settled down for him. She laughs about everything he does. They dance and they... It's cute to see them too. It's sweet to see this relationship they have because above everything, Camila is Charles' biggest supporter and he feels like that when he's with her. He feels support and he feels like someone has his back. He's relaxed a lot. We've seen them dancing in public. We've seen his compassionate side. He treats people all the same, I think, because he's a king and he's unique in his role, apart from other monarchies around the world. 2014 was officially announced as a dual year, a mechanism to strengthen ties between Britain and Mexico and promote bilateral relations between the two nations. In this year, Charles visited the state of Campeche in Mexico. Always interested in the history, traditions, culture, and environmental issues of the places he visits, he made a huge impact on those he spent time with. He was very close to people. He was smiling all the time. He was joyful. He even danced with the dancers, the Sarao dancers in Campeche with a handkerchief. So he made me feel very comfortable with him. So I forgot that he was the prince. And in the street at the end of the activity that day, I just kissed him goodbye. It was a surprise for me. I was scared and, and at the very beginning frightened because it was supposed not to kiss him. So he was very gentle. He smiled and he kissed me back. Having worked with lots of foreign visitors for the last 28 years, I can tell you that he is the top, top representative of diplomacy. As part of the Jewel Year tour, Charles and Camilla also visited Real del Monte, a Mexican town in the state of Hidalgo that in 1825 had remarkably welcomed tens of Cornish miners from Falmouth to work in the silver mining industry of the region. Whilst visiting a high school in that town, the then Duchess of Cornwall was also able to demonstrate her humility and unconditional support for her husband. Duchess of Cornwall was feeling a little bit under the weather. She was getting a cold. And so as we were touring the, the school, she cut through the patio and went into the vehicle. We continued the rest of the, of the tour. And as we were finishing, literally coming to the gate of the school, he didn't stop. He went straight into the vehicle. And we were like, he didn't say goodbye. But no, he went, he approached the vehicle, he opened the door and he said, honey, would you please come here and say goodbye to our kind host? And she was very kind also. She came down, she shook hands with a, with a principal of the school. You can see how close they are, um, that they seem to sort of fit into each other's movements. They are very, very happy together. I think it would be difficult for both of them to take on the role of king and queen. And, and Camilla doesn't necessarily like being um, in the spotlight. And she'll want to do it right. And she'll want to support Prince Charles. Um, but I think it will be, it'll be difficult, really, for her. But it's undoubtedly Charles who faces the biggest challenge. As king, he will have to make major changes in his life. 
My life will, of course, change as I take up my new responsibilities. It will no longer be possible for me to give so much of my time and energies to the charities and issues for which I care so deeply. But I know this important work will go on in the trusted hands of others. He's no longer the Prince of Wales, he is now the king, and his role will be to maintain the stability of the monarchy, to liaise with the Commonwealth, to go on royal tours, to meet and greet, and to be conducting soft diplomacy, effectively, for Britain. For many years, Charles was an awkward prince in the royal family. He had a habit of making controversial public statements. You have, ladies and gentlemen, to give this much to the Luftwaffe. When it knocked down our buildings, it didn't replace them with anything more offensive than rubble. We did that. The media dubbed him the meddling prince, but he was always careful not to comment on politics. However, he had strong opinions on many topics that today the world has finally realized are of the utmost importance. He has believed that his main contribution to life will be as will have been as Prince of Wales. I think he realized that quite a long time, time ago. The fact that he could then, and indeed should, highlight different areas of life where things were going wrong or were getting were tricky, not working properly. He had the right to say it. They didn't have to listen to him. He often complained that they didn't listen to him. But most of what he said, I think, had pretty good common sense. When we read that over the next 60 years, if we go on as we are doing, something like a third of all the forms of life at present living on this planet may be extinct, can we feel anything but a kind of cosmic horror? I don't think there's anybody who doesn't realize now that the issues which he was fighting for earlier on in his life are now very, very serious ones. And so that's very much to his credit. As heir to the throne, Prince Charles over the years assumed various functions of the Queen and also became paterfamilias of the House of Windsor after the death of his father, Prince Philip, at 99 years old. I, uh, I particularly wanted to say that uh, my father, oh, I suppose the last uh, 70 years, has given the most remarkable, devoted service uh, to the Queen, to my family, and uh, to the country, and also to the whole of the Commonwealth. And as you can imagine, uh, my family and I miss my father enormously. He was a, a much loved and appreciated figure. And uh, apart from anything else, my dear papa was a very special person who I think above all else would have been amazed by the reaction and the touching things that have been said about him. Contrary to what has been portrayed about the relationship Charles in the, in the past has, has complained about his parents being distant. I think as he grew older, he appreciated them. And certainly he talked to his mother every day on the phone and they frequently met for dinner. But it was not only his relationship with his parents that changed over time. Charles's dealings with his children, no doubt, have also continued to evolve over the years. <laughs> Ooh. You've got a very carefully <laughs> plan, Lucy. His relationship with his children was problematic when they were growing up. They were very young when their parents divorced and then when their mother died. And, and it was a difficult time. He was suddenly thrown into the role of mother and father and had to bring them up on his own. Um, they were teenagers, which obviously is, is not ideal for any father.
William and Harry were inseparable brothers who had become, after they walked behind Diana's coffin on the day of the funeral, they would become part almost of, of legend in a sense. I think that that was thought very moving and very important. Every year we get closer, and we've even resorted to hugging each other now after not seeing each other for long periods of time. And yes, he does ring me when I'm away and vice versa. Ever since our mother died, obviously we were close. Both have also continued with the social work that their parents set such a good example of. William has for years been the patron of a support centre for homeless youth, where his mother held the same position decades ago. I feel very closely linked to SensePoints. It is a charity with which both my mother and father became passionately involved. Indeed, it was while my mother was patron that Harry and I had our first contact with SensePoints. I was much younger, better looking, and more naive back then. <laughs> In so far as we know anything about the new Prince of Wales is that he does share his parents' concern about the environment and also, I think, about the public service monarchy and helping those who have fallen on bad luck in life. And I think he will continue with that tradition. As my heir, William now assumes the Scottish titles, which have meant so much to me. He succeeds me as Duke of Cornwall and takes on the responsibilities for the Duchy of Cornwall, which I have undertaken for more than five decades. Today, I am proud to create him Prince of Wales, to Wissog Cymru, the country whose title I've been so greatly privileged to bear during so much of my life and duty. With Catherine beside him, our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations, helping to bring the marginal to the centre ground where vital help can be given. William and Charles have become much closer as William became a father and had children of his own. In 2011, William married Kate Middleton at Westminster Abbey. Some time later, Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis were born. I want also to express my love for Harry and Meghan as they continue to build their lives overseas. Prince Harry, meanwhile, is also a married man today. Charles walked Meghan Markle down the aisle to marry Harry at Windsor Castle. The relationship has been widely commented on in the media, and before the wedding, they received great support from the royal family. William was longing to meet her, and so was Catherine, so, you know, they're, they are neighbours, and Catherine's been absolutely... Um, She's been wonderful. ...amazing, as is William as well, you know, fantastic support. And then my, my father's already had, a, you know, a couple of... No, more than that. We've had... A handful of teas and meetings and, and all sorts of gatherings over, over at his place as well. So, um, no, the family together have been absolutely, um, you know, solid support, and, and my grandparents as well have been have been wonderful throughout this whole process and they've known for quite some time. But Meghan's struggles with the strict routines and traditions of the British monarchy brought the royal family back into the headlines. It's obvious to anybody who reads a newspaper or watches television that um, the relationship between Prince Charles and the Duke of Sussex and the Duchess of Sussex is quite fractured. The first clear indication of the difficulty between the brothers was, of course, in South Africa, where Meghan made clear that 
she was not being listened to and far from happy. And there's no doubt that the Oprah interview did the royals a tremendous amount of damage and the fact that it underlined the rift between Charles and Harry is undoubtedly tragic for both of them. Charles is very upset that his youngest son has criticised him so openly in public, as indeed his daughter-in-law. There's a lot of sadness, as far as Britain's concerned, about the fact that the Sussexes have taken the route that they have in the way that they have. The decision of Prince Harry and his wife to leave their royal duties and move to the United States was a hard blow for Charles, who, as revealed by Harry in his controversial interview with Oprah Winfrey in early 2021, has since cut him off from any financial and emotional support. A documentary TV series premiered in 2022, and a memoir book released by Harry in January 2023 added to the controversy inside the royal family. It's precisely when the House of Windsor faces its worst PR scandal since the death of Diana that Charles takes the reins of the royal family. The idea that he wants a slim down monarchy, this is what we're constantly told. It's worthwhile just mentioning that the monarchy's already slimmed down. Andrew stepped down permanently in disgrace, even if he doesn't personally accept it. As far as the Sussexes are concerned, I see no possible way that they would wish to return. That leaves uh, essentially seven senior working royals. And that seems to be the way the contemporary monarchy is going, quite bearing in mind it's the Prince and Princess of Wales' his children, of course, who will be taking up the uh, monarchy's uh, role in the future. While Britain is still mourning the death of Elizabeth II, a cloud of uncertainty hangs over the future of the monarchy. The Queen was always consistently popular. I think it's too early, really, to say what people think about the new reign, except that it did start very well, because his address, I think, to the nation the night after the Queen died uh, was extremely effective, and he really did speak like a king. So it was a very effective and very moving speech. On behalf of all my family, I can only offer the most sincere and heartfelt thanks for your condolences and support. They mean more to me than I can ever possibly express. And to my darling Mama, as you begin your last great journey to join my dear late Papa, I want simply to say this, thank you. Thank you for your love and devotion to our family and to the family of nations you have served so diligently all these years. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. There's no question about it that the Queen is a very hard act to follow, but she's also a very good example to follow. As Shakespeare says of the earlier Queen Elizabeth, she was a pattern to all princes living. I suspect the reign of, of King Charles III will be a mixture of the continuity of his mother's role and his own experiences. Each monarch will do things differently, although I think you might find, given that he's nearly 74 years old, that he is to some extent an old man in a hurry. And so I think things will happen quite quickly because he hasn't got as much time as the Queen. And he knows that. He might transfer some of his interests to Buckingham Palace. It was noticeable that he quoted twice from Shakespeare in his tribute to the Queen. 
And I suspect we'll see a lot more Shakespeare in Buckingham Palace, perhaps more emphasis on the arts in general. He's a keen amateur painter, as he used to play the cello. Now, it may be that Buckingham Palace becomes a kind of patron of the arts. So we may see a change in the style of monarchy, because after all, Charles is a different person from his mother. The monarchy has been going for a thousand years. It's part of our DNA. Royals make the best PRs for their countries. They can go and approach any leader about any subject that probably a prime minister or president can't do. I think it's a great asset. Not only do they have a duty for their country, but they also know how they attract the interest of other countries and other leaders and other politicians. That's a great strategy in terms of marketing, public relationships, and obviously bilateral relations. Their job is bigger than what we think. Charles III comes to the throne as political instability shakes the United Kingdom. A new war ravages in Europe. And the royal family deal with family feuds. Against this backdrop, he must create the stability that the British people need, that his mother managed to do so well. The United Kingdom has not seen a coronation in 70 years, so Charles III's ceremony will undoubtedly be an impressive event that will capture the world's attention. Having seen what Britain is capable of for a state funeral um, for the Queen, I would hope that um, there will be a number of ceremonial features in this coronation. And actually the King, he, he is fairly traditional in his ways, and I think he rather likes a good show. This will always be something the British do so well. There'll be a balance between the traditional, because the service goes back over a thousand years, and the inclusive and the contemporary. Charles III's reign has only just begun, and it's still too early to know how his contemporaries will treat him. Hopefully, history will remember him as fondly as his mother. We gather today in remembrance of the remarkable span of the Queen's dedicated service to her nations and peoples. While very young, Her Late Majesty pledged herself to serve her country and her people and to maintain the precious principles of constitutional government which lie at the heart of our nation. This vow she kept with unsurpassed devotion. She set an example of selfless duty, which, with God's help and your counsels, I am resolved faithfully to follow.